Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Uh, everybody, I have to apologize. I've been doing this show for the last hour. <laughs> I thought that I was broadcasting. I was in the middle of this show and Tom Jr. Jackson called me. So I profusely apologize. How embarrassing. I have to start over. <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> anyway, this is Rob Observations episode number 952. And I'm going to start over. Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Sci-Fi and Cinema, your Evangelist of the Imagination, and of course, your Existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. And I was under the impression that I was Rob casting at you, you Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this the Post Geek Singularity. I've been doing this show for the last hour, reading articles, doing all kinds of things, and um, gosh, uh, apparently I wasn't. And um, boy, doesn't that make me look like a tool. Well, you know what? I'm just going to start over. The show must go on. And um, so I'll, I'll start, and I'm going to say that before I jumped into... To, uh, I can't believe this. I can't believe I've you I was so fired up too in my own mind. Uh many of you know, or maybe you don't, I've asked people if they wanted to. Uh they can send me videos of their collections, their art, physical media, whatever, their office. And Brian Erty, who's a member of the channel, who he and I uh share the same, we, we like a lot of the same stuff. I showed a book, a cartoon book that he had produced last week. He sent me a pretty cool video of his office, which I'm going to share with you now. Six minutes long. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to use this six minutes and try and go back and get all the material that I just shared to apparently no one. So I give it away or take it away, Brian Erty, and let's take a, le a look at your office through the short film he made called MySpace. Oh my god, it's full of stars. I'm afraid. My mind is going. I can feel it. Welcome, foolish mortals. Steel? 
shoot that woman. Bang! You're dead! <laughs> <laughs> is the Butlin County Supper Club Theater, produced by Brian Joseph Verde. Well, I wanted to thank Brian Erty for sending that in, and that was the second time, you guys, I can't even begin to tell you. I I read articles. I've been going on for an hour, over an hour. I thought I was broadcasting. I had no idea I wasn't. <laughs> That's never happened to me before, so I hope I can keep up my same level of enthusiasm. Now, one of the other things that I'm going to show you tonight, special, special little uh, treat, 
As many of you know, or many of you probably don't know, but I'm working on another, another feature film, a follow-up, some of the same team that made Tango Shalom, director Gabe Bologna. Uh, I, I'm on as a producer. Uh, <coughs> we have made a much different movie called White Devils that's based on a South African playwright's work. And many of you know that uh, Vinny Guastini, the, the uh, effects artist, makeup effects artist, He's been in the business a long time. Uh, we went to his shop and we shot some second unit stuff. He did some gore effects and I stood in. I was getting flogged and whipped and I had full prosthetics on my back and bleeding and I basically stood in to get whipped to death. And today we um, picture locked. And I showed an example. We, we created these montage sequences. Now I'm going to show you a, a clip a white devil's clip um, that we've now locked picture, and I'll just give you a little, little, little taste of the movie. But you can see the final, the final. It's a, it's a montage of gore, essentially death, murder, and um, it has no sound effects and it's not color timed. So, but I figured I'd show it because it's kind of fun. This was the last segment that we, we, we finished, and um, got to give a shout out to Casey, our editor. Working on this, I didn't edit this one, and uh, there, there's a couple of editors that worked on it, but Casey did this piece. So this is a little taste of our film, White Devils. The curtains, they flap and flap, it's because she's angry. She's dead. They're both dead. Dead and buried. Scattered all over the place, remember? Not a lot of context there, but that was a little sequence that we finally finished. Now we can send it all into sound mixing and wrap up the show. So uh, again, I, I'm going to have to remember this. I had a bunch of articles lined up um, to to show you. And you know when I'm when you're doing these shows, I I, I, I saw that Tom tried to call me. I don't know if someone. <laughs> You know, it's really hard when you're one person and I had these four articles lined up. I had all these things lined up and I'd been thinking about what I wanted to talk about. So basically, you're going to you're going to get the same stuff over, but you haven't heard it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's crazy. So anyway, the reason I wanted to do a show on suspension of disbelief, I'm always talking to you guys. I'm always banging on about verisimilitude, which is the quality of being real. And of course, like so many other people, the first time I really was aware of that word was because of Richard Donner and and uh, Superman the movie. And I remember seeing it, I don't know if it was behind the scenes stuff when I was a kid, but it was a word that I've loved for a very long time. And when you're creating something, whether you're writing a science fiction, fantasy, or horror story, or whether you're making a movie, verisimilitude is... Uh, is to me the thing that you want to you you want to make something feel real, The Exorcist to me peak verisimilitude. Uh, you believe that movie, you know, and and I think a lot of the great fantasy films, science fiction, fantasy, and horror, uh, verisimilitude is is really important because when you have peak verisimilitude, you have suspension of disbelief, and to me suspension of disbelief goes hand in hand with verisimilitude because even though you might be creating the most fantastical of worlds those worlds have to be governed by a reality an internal reality if anything can happen at any time well the audience you lose the audience and as i've often said on this show that the best fiction is the most most truthful fiction and after i did the show last night about star trek and and for me, the great takeaway from that article is that with Star Trek's vision of a utopian future, the institutions that we see in Star Trek, such as Starfleet, they also have to be equally utopian because that's where our characters come from. They come out of those systems. 
And by subverting and making Starfleet basically the antagonists, as they have been so often in modern Star Trek, it's not that they weren't. There were always a crazy admiral or two here and there, and there was always certain things going on. Sometimes there was some shady shit happening. But for the most part, Star Trek is about Starfleet's officers' devotion to the truth, as I covered last night. And I think one of the real problems, and just to reiterate, is how do you make a show like Starfleet Academy if you don't believe that the Federation can have institutions that are beyond reproach? And I think that some of our my uh, the things that I love the most when I was talking about s- school movies, because I love school movies, is like with Goodwill Hunting, or you you see uh, the Skarsgård's professors. Is he might be cantankerous and egomaniacal, but he's a good man, you know. And the great school movies are about great educators that students can can look up to. And I know that's sort of fallen out of favor. But one of the things is, if you're going to have an institution that's inherently a good institution like Starfleet, you have to make us believe. And it's easier to tear down than build up. Well, yesterday after I did that show, I got a a letter from our friend Undead Sick in Holland. Uh, You might remember a couple weeks back he wrote a a letter talking about his terrible childhood and the things that he went through and shared with us. But he wrote me a letter that really, uh, it kind of stuck in my craw because I don't think he quite understood what I was saying. But he was saying something, I think we're actually on the same page, but we're coming at it from different angles. But I wanted to read this, and this is what set me off on this idea of suspension of disbelief. Hello, Rob. I write this letter to you as a reaction to your latest rant about Star Trek. Because I am just like Star Wars, I disagree with you on one thing. You once again said that it makes you believe, or it has to make you believe. And I will say, no, it doesn't. Because at the end of the day, like I said before, it's escapist fantasy. I will use some examples of what I mean. In Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, our characters jump out of a crashing airplane in an inflatable rubber boat. That is probably the most unbelievable scene I've ever seen in my life. And yet, it doesn't matter. It's something you call suspension of disbelief. In Star Wars A New Hope, Luke Skywalker flies through a miniature pipeline with a spaceship and he then uses to fire torpedoes at an exhaust port the size of my kitchen sink. But I didn't care, and you know why? Because it's science fiction. You only live twice. There's a secret base inside a volcano that no one's ever found? Come on. From Terminators and Xenomorphs to Cancer Guns, Werewolves and Spider-Man. I've seen it all, and I never in my whole childhood was I ever thinking, oh my god, this is so believable, or wow, this is just like real life. No, if I want that, I will watch World War II movies or documentaries. The very reason that I watched things like Star Wars, Aliens, Robocop, or whatever was because it was fun, escapist, science fiction. Fantasies that told me fun stories which allowed me to get out of the shitstorm that was my childhood life, which I already told you about. And that's the reason I got invested in these stories and characters, because I knew it wasn't real. It allowed me to have fun in a different universe with weird characters before I had to get back to the hell I was living in back then. And then this whole thing about Starfleet having to be the best of the best and the top of the line. Respectfully, I wish you could hear yourself saying that. You know what that sounds like to me? That's elitism right there. By making that statement, you're basically telling people that the only way you can matter or be accepted and be heard or seen as a human being is when you are nothing but perfection. Maybe we should ask the Terrell Corporation to turn us all into replicants. Do you think human beings will be accepted then? Now, I absolutely absolutely agree with you that these stories still have to be good in the context of the universe it takes place in, and that's totally true. But a story being good and it being believable or like real life are two completely different things. I'm awaiting your thoughts, Rob. Greetings from Holland. Undead sick. Now, uh, here's the thing. I don't, I mean, I understand what, what, and I think everybody understands what he's saying, and he's not wrong. But what I'm saying is different, and I think he kind of 
is not quite getting what I'm trying to say. And um, <laughs> yes, thank you to Tom Jr. Hunter. As Hunter Becknell says, I thank Tom Jr. Jackson for calling me because I swear to God, I would have gone on for two hours talking about this. Now, when I set up these shows, I had these articles to read. They're down in the link. The first, the it's funny because the William Saffron story, I'm not going to read. It, it, it didn't, it just didn't come off well and I didn't do a good job of reading it. But if you want to follow along, I'm not going to put the article up only because when I finish the articles, I drop them out of the show and the show, I, I pre-build these shows before I, um, before I start them. But I'm going to read the articles because I want to get into what suspension of disbelief is. But uh, I'm going to give you the rant that I was giving while Tom called me. And I would say when uh, we talk about suspension of disbelief, the, <laughs> I'm going to start early by saying this. Game of Thrones, to me, is a perfect example of suspension of disbelief and then when the authors betray that suspension of disbelief and how we get pissed as fans. So in Game of Thrones, if you're a fan, you remember uh, the, the first five seasons of Game of Thrones are pretty great. Pretty great. Have uh, not many complaints. One of the greatest TV shows ever made. Well, one of the things that they do in that show is make the world of Westeros, even though there's dragons and there's magic and there's dark priestesses and there's men with no faces and there's all kinds of craziness going on. The show itself is presented in a matter of fact, real place because it's shot on real locations. There are not a lot of matte shots of vistas, you know, that are unbelievable because it's shot in what looks like the real world. We believe in it. But then they do things like, if you remember in the first season, Robert Baratheon, who's king at the time, goes from King's Landing to Winterfell. It takes him a month. It takes him a month. They've got carts, they've got horses, they've got army, and they, they march from, from King's Landing to Winterfell. And it takes a month to get there. Now, I believe that. And by doing that, it shows you, it gives you, with that particular plot point, it shows you that Westeros has distance and, and people don't just, you can't just get on a horse and go from one place to another in a day. It's provided us a context and that's how the real world would work. Now we as viewers can go, okay, so maybe that's the distance from going from Los Angeles to Seattle. If you're going to march and it takes a month, I can drive it in a day and a half or actually a day if I really want to, 18 and a half hours is my record. But if I wanted to go from my hometown or back LA to Seattle, my hometown and back, I've done it in 18, actually I've done it in 16 and a half hours once, but I don't recommend that ever. But it gives you a, a distance. So suddenly we as viewers go, okay, that tells us it could be a thousand miles, you know, break down how many, how, how long does this caravan travel per day? And, and it gives you a reality to believe in. Cut to, what, uh, the seventh season? So we're beyond the wall. We're fighting White Walkers, all right? And, and we're on a little island surrounded by water, and the White Walkers are massing, and we're fucked. And they basically send somebody to send a raven to get help. And the raven has to fly all the way to Dragonstone, tell Danny that, up oh, we're fucked. Can you come help us? And then she can get on a dragon and fly all the way back and save us. It happens in like a day, like 24 hours. And after they've spent season after season after season making us believe in Westeros, we know that that situation that's happening with that life or death moment where they're fighting the White Walkers and somebody runs and throws a raven from the from the wall and it goes all the way to Dragonstone and Danny gets to come back with dragons and save everyone... We know that can't happen. We know that it took Robert Baratheon a month to go from King's Landing to Winterfell. So there's no fucking way, no matter how fast a raven can fly, that it can go all the way to Dragonstone, warn Danny, and she can come back within a day, within the, the same time that we're fighting off White Walkers, where we're going to hold out not for very much longer, certainly not a month. We've got maybe a day, if, if we're lucky, as soon as they did that in Game of Thrones, and they did this over and over again, 
as as season six, seven, and eight happened, and the the credul uh, the uh, credibility of the show out the window because we no longer suspended our disbelief. They're now doing things that break our belief. They break our belief. And when you break the belief of your audience in something that you've spent so much time making them believe in, well, then you've lost them. It has nothing to do with things like identity politics or representation, although that's part of it. Identity politics also can break the reality of a show because it's our real world and the obvious concerns like somebody is shoehorning something in like Rings of Power. You know, you're shoehorning something in or people complaining that there's not enough representation on Shogun. They're like, you know, at one point there were these kinds of, there were, there were black samurai. Well, if you know much, there's one, sure, but you know how xenophobic the the Japanese were. Um, There just wasn't, you know, you can scour the historical records and you can say, look, there's gotta be, no, 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 no. It wasn't like people were freely traveling around the world at that point. So to make that kind of stuff uh, an issue, you're breaking the reality of what actually happened. Tolkien's world, as he will tell you, Middle Earth, same thing. He was making a myth for England at a specific time and place. And the demographics, you can go back and look in history, the demographics are what they were. It's not racist to make those demographics uh, fit the time period. You know, it's just like Anne Boleyn was not black, but you can shoot. But what that does is it breaks verisimilitude and it breaks suspension of disbelief. Now, a lot of things can do that. And that to me, verisimilitude and suspension of disbelief go into the same place. So what Undead Sick was talking about, about Indiana Jones in Temple of Doom. I agree. You know, if you were going to jump out of a plane at 10,000 feet and use a raft and hit it and it's starting to inflate as you jumped, expecting it to break your fall at 10,000 feet, I got news for you. You're going to die. However, I would say this. That scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at the beginning when Lao Che's plane is going down, they're crossing the Himalayas, it goes right up to the edge and maybe over it. But the thing about it is they're not at 10,000 feet. They're very close to the ground. They're not falling that far. And when the thing is inflating, it is, uh, it is, um, uh, I could believe it. And you're on a slope. I'm a skier. I grew up skiing. I have jumped off many, uh, a cliff. I've jumped 50 feet down. And when you are in the air and you land on a slope, you don't die. If you're going to jump 50 feet and land on the flat ground, you might die or break your legs. But if you're a skier, you know you can fly off the side of a peak and fall pretty damn far and land, especially if you're on a steep, if you're on the top of Mount, uh, Mammoth at the top, what is it, chair 16, and you, you you drop in on the bowl, you can fall pretty damn far and you're on a sloped bowl that carries you down. Well, in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, they go right up to the edge And while we all laugh, the thing actually falling down, it doesn't fall that far. Not really. And it lands on a slope. So as a skier, I'm like, I'll buy it. It might be. And and the fun of it is that the filmmakers know it's straining credulity. and, And it's still fun. But they're very close to breaking. And this is the thing. If they had expected you to believe that they were landing on a flat surface... It wouldn't have worked, but you're landing on a slope. It's bouncing down a slope and it continues on and it goes even, it gets even crazier. So within the context of that scene, you can buy it. You can believe it. And this is what I mean by suspension of disbelief. Robocop is a character that you believe in because he begins, Murphy is a man and Murphy is so violently killed. Remember Robocop and, and Verhoeven would tell you this because He's a Catholic, and a lot of his movies have religious imagery in them. The Fourth Man, which I dearly love. By the way, please, somebody, Fourth Man on 4K, give me, give it to me. Give it to me now. Um, 
but but Murphy is crucified. The beginning of RoboCop when he is he is he's literally crucified, and he is resurrected as RoboCop because it has more meaning in it. It's not just some guy walking around who's invincible, and and he's now RoboCop. You know, and and he's shown, and he's given pathos, and you believe because they show you a credible something credible that could happen. Now RoboCop. The way they give it to you, they show you the development of the technology. They show you how it all happens. They show you that he's having flashbacks of his own family life. RoboCop makes you believe that RoboCop can exist. That's what I'm talking about. Sure, it's a fantasy creation that can take you back. But the reason it's good and the reason, I mean, you have something called RoboCop. It could go either way. But Paul Verhoeven went out of his way with with. Uh, Newmeyer and you know his writing staff to make sure that you believed that that was credible, that it, it didn't strain credulity, that you could actually believe that RoboCop existed. That's what I'm talking about. My problem with a lot of modern Star Trek is that, as the article said that I read last night, you know, you 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 have to believe that these characters, and and not everybody gets to be what I, I'm not talking about Star Trek is about um, the only the elite. I'm saying that the people that have graduated from Starfleet Academy that are on starships are the best of the best because they have to be. And that's why I love the show because I, as a viewer, aspired to one day be a, somebody like that, not literally because I'm not going to live in the th- 23rd century and I'm not going to be on a fictional starship that probably will never exist anyway. What I'm talking about is aspiring to that kind of excellence. Now, maybe not literally, because how do you get to be that excellent? Maybe you can't, but it's aspirational. I'm not saying that, that we, the audience, have to be elitists, but the show is about the very elite. That's part of what it was doing. What modern Star Trek has done is they're uncomfortable with that narrative. They want people to not, which I don't understand. If you're watching a show about these kinds of people, they are the elite. And when you make them less than elite and you make them like, I don't believe Tilly, not because of the way she looks, not because Mary Wiseman isn't cute as a button, but I don't believe the way her character is written. She ever went through Starfleet Academy. I don't believe any of the way the characters are written on Star Trek Discovery. I don't believe anything that they've ever done on that show. It, it, it has no, I have no suspension of disbelief because they haven't made me suspend my disbelief because the people writing the show do not believe in the future that Star Trek depicts. They don't. They don't believe in it. They don't even believe because all we, and like the article said, today we are cynical about everything. We're cynical about the government. We're cynical about our institutions. We're cynical about America. There's nothing we believe in anymore. Star Trek was a show about belief in a utopian civilization that was possible to forge 300 years hence. Star Trek is that's what it's about. You know, that's its premise. And and the the boldly going and meeting the alien civilizations, the alien civilizations were showing us our problems today and how they could be overcome by the people that we want to become one day. That's the whole point. That's what I was trying to say. But now you're, you're going to get a Starfleet Academy show made by people that don't believe in the institution of Starfleet in the first place. And the whole fun of when you watch the great shows of school, whether it's um, Dead Poets Society or you know School Ties or the Paper Chase or you know even Goodwill Hunting when you had Scars Guards. Uh, uh, teacher you believe that those people could exist because teachers those characters are the best of the best you believe in them nowadays you know we we see teachers on tiktok spouting off their identity politics i mean when i was going when i was growing up if a teacher did that they'd be fired if a teacher you know i've often said to people it's weird. It was weird when we were younger to see teachers outside of a teaching environment. I never, it was a weird thing because you don't, you didn't believe teachers had a life of their own because they were there. They didn't represent human beings to you. They represented knowledge and you, they were, they were, they were an obstacle you had to pass through and get by them. 
you know, and, and now that teachers, like so many other people, everything has been demystified. And when you have teachers on TikTok demystifying themselves, they fucking undercut their position as teachers. It's so weird. I'm going to bring this. I'm going to bring myself into my classroom. Why? That's not your job, man. Your job is to not bring yourself into the classroom. What you are supposed to bring into the classroom is to instill a love of knowledge in your students. You shouldn't have them worried about you at all, nor should you try to be impart your your politics or your feelings or your identity onto your class. You are getting in the way of your job. You're a shitty teacher if you're doing that. You're a shitty teacher. And that's one of the problems that we have right now. But anyway, suspension of disbelief. Let me get into this article that I wanted to read. Not the William Safran article, but I wanted to read this article from Studio Binder. Studio Binder is one of the great places on YouTube to go uh, if you want to know a lot about filmmaking. They do so many great breakdowns on different aspects of filmmaking, but they did a thing on suspension of disbelief in film. And uh, I wanted to cover this. Now, this was written by Chris Heckman on January 22nd, 2023. What is suspension of disbelief? How it works in storytelling. Suspension of disbelief give ar gives artists the liberty to create worlds in a realm separate from reality. But what is suspension of disbelief? Where did suspension of disbelief originate? And why is suspension of disbelief important to artists and connoisseurs of art? We're going to answer these questions by defining suspension of disbelief and by looking at suspension of disbelief examples. By the end, you'll know everything there is to know about suspension of disbelief. What does suspension of disbelief mean? English poet and philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge is widely credited with introducing suspension of disbelief in his 1817 text, Biographia Literaria. This suspension, also referred to as poetic faith, is meant to examine supernatural persons and characters, or at least romantic, yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and a semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment." Coleridge and colleague William Wordsworth espoused the philosophy of suspending disbelief in their writing. At some level, we must be able to recognize a story as something unbelievable, because the alternative is that we recognize a story as something just as real as our regular lives. Some philosophers argue that suspension of disbelief is essential to healthy cognitive function, and thus, individuals who are unable to to suspend disbelief, especially in regards to violent media, present higher degrees of cognitive dissonance and psychopathy. But before we get too far into the issue, let's first define suspension of disbelief. Suspension of disbelief is the avoidance of logic in works of fiction, or the unreal filter through which connoisseurs of art choose to accept as part of the Diegesis, diegesis, um, diegetic, for instance, something that's diegetic, and I explained this before. If you have a scene in a movie that has a character turning on a radio or putting on a CD or a, a, a vinyl and music is playing in the scene that a character has turned on, that is diegetic music that's happening in the scene. If you're listening to, say, the Pointer Sisters' Neutron Dance over the opening action truck uh, escape in Beverly Hills Cop, that is not diegetic because that music is playing on the soundtrack. Eddie Murphy cannot hear the Pointer Sisters in that scene. Now, if we saw the driver of the truck turn that music on, then it becomes diegetic. And even though they play it for you and it fills the surround speakers, it's still diegetic because it's in the scene. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, the tenants behind suspension of disbelief was commented on by Greek writers such as Aristotle and was formally presented by poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1817. Movies often ask audiences to suspend disbelief when it comes to unbelievable circumstances. The repetitive use of unbelievable circumstances is regarded as a movie trope, and some examples include enemies who are way less powerful than the protagonists, 
a.k.a. cannon fodder, Star Wars stormtroopers, opposing military forces, etc. Technology that doesn't and may never exist. The enhanced mode in police procedurals or court, court dramas. Elements of Due Ex Machina, some savior arrives at the perfect time. To suspend disbelief is to accept such conditions as natural parts of the movie's digesis. That doesn't mean the usage of these conditions are immune to criticism. Many movie critics often say that if one is willing to suspend their disbelief, they will find enjoyment in certain movies. I disagree. You can suspend your disbelief, but a movie still has to have verisimilitude for you to like it. That's why I can't stand the last two Fast and the Furious movies. Fast and the Furious 9 and 10 completely dispensed with any shred of verisimilitude. See, the funny thing is, Fast 5, which I love dearly, has lots of verisimilitude, but when you get to the point where two cars are dragging a, a safe, that, by the way, two cars couldn't drag, that's the ask. They, 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 that's a big ask, but they make you believe. But that, that two cars could drag that safe, that's suspension of disbelief. That was, by the time you get to Fast and Furious 7 and you've got one car leaping from one building to another, that's not. They shattered my suspension of disbelief. I liked it. It was fun. But that's, for me, they literally jumped the shark. There was no shark, though. They just jumped from one building to another. And that's when the Fast and the Furious franchise left me behind. Eight more so. Torpedoes on the ice. Nine and ten. And I can't even watch them. I, those movies are literally painful for me to watch. I love the Fast and the Furious franchise. I'll watch Too Fast, Too Furious. It's not that it's a great movie, but I'll still watch it because it's fun. I love The Drift, not just because of Nikki Griffin being as cute as she is, but I just love The Drift. I love Han. I love the Japanese setting. I love it all. But by the time you get to Fast and Furious 7, the credibility, because we all know what it's like to ride in a car. The whole point of having car racing movies or car chases is that we've all been in cars. We all know what it's like to be in cars. So when someone's driving 100 miles an hour through a city, we know what it's like. But if the car can do things that we know cars can't do, you're out. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Undead Sick might think it's fun to watch. I can't. You can take me up to a point, and then I'm out. And then I'm out. Anyway, consequently... Uh, for a surrealist movie, such as a racer head or a romantic movie, like the one in the style of Coleridge, there's plenty of room to play with characters and imagery beyond reality, which works. Perhaps it's true that suspension of disbelief is impossible to uphold. But what's the alternative? A conscious state of perfect perception? There's no definite answer, but there is a well-warranted perspective. That is, that suspension of disbelief allows us to enjoy works of art. Many of the world's most popular games task players with committing excessive violence on a massive scale. That doesn't sound good, right? Well, it wouldn't be if players weren't able to suspend disbelief and understand that video games are not real. Suspension of disbelief is rooted in the theory of catharsis, or the release of tension through a form of exercise. In the case of gaming, tension is released through the exercise of competition. Not just multiplayer competition, but single-player competition as well. The act of completing a challenge has been demonstrably proven to have a cathartic effect on people young and old. Suspension of disbelief asks us to look past a story's imperfections, because we know it isn't real. But what happens when a story is based on something that actually happened? Well, there's another article that will talk about how to adapt a true story, which I'm not going to read, but that was just a uh, beginning of suspension of disbelief and what I think is important about it. And I think that most of our major franchises, everyone's talking about identity politics and everyone's talking about the message and all of these things that uh, we're seeing injected into our franchises. I think the problem that all of our franchises are suffering from is we can no longer en masse the audience out there, the astute audience, the, the, the real core fans, the shows, we're no longer, we can't suspend our disbelief 
because the people that are making the shows that we love, the movies and the shows, the franchise properties that we love, they don't know how to do it. They are breaking verisimilitude and they are breaking suspension of disbelief. See, then they attack the fans and all the all hell breaks loose. But it's actually very simple. The MCU is a perfect example. If you go back and you look at it, the MCU, they had it pretty well, as much as you've got Thanos and the Guardians of the Galaxy and all the shenanigans, if you watch, say, Captain America Winter Soldier and even Civil War, watch the Captain America trilogy. Captain America, the first Avengers, pretty fantastical. Their vision of, of 19, 1940s or late 30s, 40s America, little fantastical. Uh, their vision of Hydra, fantastical. The Red Skulls, fantastical. And Captain America, the first Avenger, though, has kind of a classic, in a way, it's a bit of a fairy tale. The forging of Captain America that will now know and love in the modern age. But when you get to Winter Soldier, how does Winter Soldier begin? Winter Soldier begins and you have the meet cute between Steve Rogers and Sam Wilson. You're running around the mall of in Washington, D.C., Washington Monuments there. And what's amazing is they do something fantastic. And this is how you establish both verisimilitude and suspension of disbelief. Sam Wilson's jogging, and then they show Steve Rogers, because he's a super soldier, can jog 10 times faster than Sam Wilson can. On your left. On your left. Because he's much faster. We believe. We believe because he's not running too fast. You know, he's not going, meow, meow, meow. No, no, no. He's running fast. But he's running in a, in a way that we believe. So we're, we know that a, human, a regular human being cannot run that fast. But because he's a super soldier, he's taken the serum, and we know he's Captain America, we suspend our disbelief because the movie has made us believe in that ability. And it's presented in a very down-to-earth way. And the entire context of the situation is two men running in the morning, exercising. And it leads all up to, and what really slams at home, is you've got two guys at the end of that sequence, after you have a funny, it's, it's, it's only something that happened in a superhero, superhero movie where someone has fantastical powers. But at the end of the scene, it's two soldiers meeting. They're equal. Captain America might have different abilities than Sam Wilson, but Sam Wilson works with veterans. They're two soldiers, mutual respect, two men that admire one another. That's how that scene ends. You love it. That's where you create credibility. That's where you create suspension of disbelief. And that's where you create verisimilitude in a fantasy context. Beautiful. Marvel, whether you're watching the Marvels, whether you're watching the Eternals, whether you're watching all of Phase 4 and 5, they no longer establish that at all. Quantum Mania, I didn't believe him, hardly any of it. And the funny thing was, the Ant-Man franchise, the Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, made me believe, especially the first Ant-Man movie. I believed. But you go to the quantum realm, and suddenly the quantum realm itself was not presented in a believable manner. It was goofy. And you know what's funny? You can still do goofy and make you believe. Guardians 1, the tone of Guardians 1. What happens at the beginning of that movie? You watch Peter Quill's mom dying. It immediately sets you in a time and a place where you fucking believe. Because we all know people who've died of cancer, died of some kind of health related. And it's tragic. And we get it. From the very beginning of that movie, James Gunn makes you believe. And once you believe, then a spaceship can come out of the sky and whisk Peter Quill away. And then we get him dancing to find an artifact. And you believe it. And even though it's got funny stuff, James Gunn knows how to take us right to the edge. I mean, the fact that we believe in all those characters and what, is, what does he do? I mean, even when you see the great scene in the outdoor mall on Xandar, that scene is funny. It shows all the, the characters' powers, but it's not too much. It's actually, they're just trying, they're just playing keep away, basically. It's a great sequence. It shows everybody's, Superpowers, essentially, but you believe. You believe it's got verisimilitude and it makes you believe 
it uh, you, you you suspend your disbelief because it makes you believe. Brilliantly done. All of our franchises now are suffering from broken verisimilitude, but most importantly, broken suspension of disbelief because they have put uh, more importance on, like, I can't, I was talking about this last night, Star Trek Discovery Season 5, Episode 1, has seen a scene where two starships crash into the fucking ground on a planet. <laughs> Boom. And survive. I'm like, I don't care what kind of technology you have. I don't. I will never believe that. I, when I, I, I'm like, get the fuck out, Michelle Paradise, who wrote the episode. I'm like, Michelle Paradise, you don't get it. You clearly don't read science fiction. You're you're not a particularly you're not a science fiction fan. You've never read. We're going to talk about Werner Vinge later because I just realized I forgot to talk about him, at the, which I talked about the first time I did this show. But when you see that, you're like the people that are making this show do not understand their own show. They don't understand what they're supposed to be doing, and this is plaguing all of our franchise properties, all of them. Because the people that are making them are breaking verisimilitude and they are not allowing people to suspend their disbelief. And if you don't suspend your disbelief, you don't give a fuck. I mean, it's it's just like Thor Ragnarok compared to Thor Love and Thunder. Thor Ragnarok had enough stuff going on that you bought into it, even though it's goofy fun. But it didn't make you... Like when Thor comes out and confronts Hulk. And he's like, yes, it's a friend from work. That's hilarious. Hilarious joke. But then Hulk's going to kill him. So you get the funny, but you're still within the realm of plausibility. You have not broken your verisimilitude and you have not broken suspension of disbelief. Thor Love and Thunder breaks your uh, uh, suspension. Now, people have different thresholds, of course. Some people don't care. But the thing is, you can't, you have to pick a metric. And I, 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 I use myself. <laughs> As a metric, because that's the only metric I can come by. And I think that I have enough perception or powers of perception. I've seen enough stories to understand. One of my favorite movies of all time is Amelie. Amelie, uh, there's a lot of suspension of disbelief that goes on there. It also dips into whimsy. And it does things, it even presents reality in a way that's whimsical. I think that movie does an incredible job. A, it is a masterpiece of threading a needle that very few people can do. Jean-Pierre Genet kills it with that movie. That movie, to me, in terms of if you wanted to look into my head and sort of extract my philosophy of life, it's in Amelie. That presentation, by the way, it comes out. The new 2K restoration, because there can't be a 4K restoration, unfortunately, but... It comes out this week in a steel book. I'm very excited. But this is the problem. And and when they talk about uh, injecting identity politics, that that's just symptomatic. That that that's the easiest way to to strain credulity, you know. It's uh it's 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 a bummer. Anyway, I have another article I wanted to read. This came from Medium, another Medium article. I know anybody can write them, but Medium has interesting you know, interesting articles. I like to go there. And uh, Matt Ray wrote this article on November 22nd, 2019. I was having a discussion with my girlfriend about movies the other day. She told me about a movie that she said was a great movie. I'm a movie buff, so I was intrigued to see what she considered a great movie. But after watching the movie, I realized it wasn't that great after all. After all, it was a good movie but definitely not one I would classify as great. In our discussions, I tried to explain to her why I didn't consider it to be a great movie, even though she did. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, right? Why was it a great movie for her and just a good movie for me? Was it a matter of taste? Perhaps in part, but it was more than that. I finally made progress with her by explaining one difference between a good movie and a great movie is the movie's ability to willingly suspend our disbelief. I want to stop here and mention that I'm not a professional film critic, nor have I ever studied film, other than my own experience and classes in the humanities in college. These are ideas I've formulated on my own based on watching way too many movies. 
The concept of suspending your disbelief is one I learned in college, which I will summarize by saying the following. In order for drama, theater, and most fiction to succeed, it has to convince us to suspend our disbelief or suspend our rational mind from saying, this isn't real, it's artificial. In other words, a movie or a play, uh, hang on, I've got to, I just realized I forget to check in. Um, in other words, a movie or a play succeeds when you allow yourself to believe it's not just a play, but engage in the fantasy that it is real and something you're experiencing as real in your mind or at least something you want to believe is real. It's not just a script that someone wrote, a bunch of lines that someone memorized, or a set that was created by a team of people. When it's done right, you engage in a way that all of that disappears, and it becomes real and sometimes cathartic to you. It causes you to ignore the fact that it is a play or a film. Sometimes it causes you to think differently about life, and it creates emotions within that surprise you. You don't think about all the pieces that make up the film. You simply enjoy it as a whole, and it allows you to escape into that belief. All movies, to me, are a sliding scale in their ability to make me willingly suspend my disbelief. The better the movie is, the more easily I move into the suspension of my disbelief. The worse the movie is, the more frustrated I am with it. Hence the Fast and the Furious franchise. I often criticize the hell out of it the whole time either out loud if I'm watching it with others, or in my own mind if I'm watching it by myself. Yeah, I'm one of those guys. But if I'm going to invest a couple of hours on a movie, I'd prefer doing it with one that gets all the basics right. As soon as the basics are wrong or bad, I start losing interest in completing the movie, and I've turned many movies off because I didn't believe them. In other words, I was unable to suspend my belief because... They'd missed or disbelief because they'd missed too many of the basics. So, what are the basics? To me, they're all the things that come together to make something believable. Specifically in film, it's things like acting, writing, plot, storyline, and dialogue are all important. Cinematography, effects, sound, editing, etc. If you get just one of these things wrong, the film suffers, and so does the believability. Sometimes a movie is so good or the concepts being introduced in the movie are so mind-blowing that I pause my mind and say something like, damn, this is some of the best writing I've enjoyed in a while, or wow, the concepts introduced here are so creative, I want to take some notes. By, by, by my definition, this movie has failed to completely suspend my disbelief. But usually after first watching, I can go back and enjoy those movies without interruption. My technical analytical mind is switched off and I can now immerse myself into the suspension of disbelief. The movie in question, the one that caused this article to be written, was The Ghost in the Darkness, starring Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer. Someone will probably want to argue with me about this movie, but that's okay. As I said, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. In fact, I actually started questioning my own opinion of this movie because it won an Academy Award for its effects and sound effects. The basic plot of the movie is a bridge builder, Val Kilmer, who was given the assignment to build a bridge in Africa. Despite his best efforts, he kept failing because of two man-eating lions on the loose, killing workers almost every day. It's based on a true story. The effects and sound effects of the lions killing all these men were well done. It was challenging to make that aspect of the movie seem real. The cinematography was also quite nice. But even though the movie succeeded in these areas, it failed in other areas, specifically in the acting and the writing. Have you ever heard an actor speak in a way that it didn't seem natural for them to say the things that they're saying? It's either a problem with the script and the written dialogue or a problem with the ability of the actor to pull the dialogue off in a believable manner. I struggled with Michael Douglas's dialogue throughout the movie and found his southern accent and the things he said quite unbelievable. There were also holes in the dialogue, in my opinion, throughout the film. There were stories told and analogies made that just didn't seem to flow in a believable way. Some of the problems in the dialogue were more to do with Michael Douglas's delivery than the writing itself, but in some cases the actual writing just didn't work. As soon as one of these flaws gets into my brain as an obvious flaw, my belief suspension starts to crumble, and at that point the movie fails for me. 
It's like a mind worm you can't get out. I'm pretty sure most people have experienced a situation where they just aren't enjoying the movie they're watching. Sometimes they can't even pinpoint what the problem is. They are just no longer able to suspend their disbelief. There are also some people who find it impossible to suspend their disbelief on any level. They usually stick with nonfiction books and movies as anything less factual doesn't work for them. I have a friend who never watches or reads any fiction for that reason. There are several ways you can systematically find good movies. Not all movies are going to work for you, so developing a system that works will help you have a more enjoyable movie-watching experience. For example, when I find an actor or director who delivers the basics and more on a movie and it takes very little effort for me to suspend my disbelief, I search for other movies they've acted in or directed. The right director can make, you, can make an actor better than he normally would be. And once you find a movie that has a winning combination, you can typically find other movies by that director that also consistently succeed. Sometimes you find an actor who is questionable in some roles, but if they work with the right director or find a role that is more suited for them and their acting style, it makes all the difference in the world. One example for me is Will Ferrell. As a comedian, I know he's quite funny, but I felt that many of his acting roles were hit and miss throughout the years. You never know if the movie he was in was going to be good or not. Actually, SNL in general is like that, but it's supposed to be that way. It's experimental television that is live. Sometimes it's going to work and other times it won't. For me, that all changed when Will Ferrell starred in the movie Elf. Elf was the perfect role for him. He and the director nailed it. It was a farcical story, but because the movie combined the right acting, script, directing, etc., it was enjoyable and easy for me to suspend my disbelief, regardless of how silly a movie it was. I mean, it was a story about Santa Claus and elves, for God's sake. However, I was able to forget about that and enjoy the film. I believe he's gone on to make other movies like this as well, recognizing his strengths and weaknesses and working in roles or films that suit them. Stranger Than Fiction is a perfect example of one of these films. I like to choose movies that have been directed by a top director. How do you find a top director? Google something like Top 25 Greatest Directors. A list is like this maybe uh, a list like this is like it's not a list. A list like this may be hit and miss for your tastes, but the majority of them will get it all get all the basics right and will most likely be able to blow your mind in the process creating a cathartic reaction everybody should have a favorite set of directors and actors they go to when they want something good to watch otherwise you're just watching random movies and hoping for the best i love anything the coen brothers do all of their movies tend to be unpredictable both in plot and acting which is a good thing for me i hate a movie that is predictable when I saw George Clooney acting in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, the Coen brothers brought something out in him that I'd never seen in his acting before. Other movies by the Coen brothers are Fargo. Both the movie and the series on FX have the same Coen brothers quirkiness and style, although the series isn't done by them. True Grit, No Country for Old Men, Raising Arizona, and many others. Directors I tend to trust are Quentin Tarantino, James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, Peter Jackson, Francis Ford Coppola, Guy Ritchie, and Martin Scorsese, to name a few. Plus, there are many other directors who have their own creative style or have learned from the best. They, too, are knocking it out of the park, sometimes by learning the art and craft from filmmakers that went before them. Another way to find great movies is to watch those that are award-winning. Oscar-winning movies are almost always getting the bases covered and more, which is why I often search for winners and nominees. Same goes for Golden Globes or Sundance. Finding great movies to watch is not a hard thing to do once you realize what makes a great movie. With the tools discussed in this article, you should be able to find those films that cover the basics and more. The better the film, it's easier for you to suspend your disbelief, and more enjoyable it will be for you. I do understand that there are some movies you will want to watch for different reasons, such as a cult classic, even if the acting or effects aren't that good. I get that, but if you're looking for a quality movie, that you can easily suspend your disbelief Using some of the tools discussed here should help you. Well, I would say that this article brought up some good points, but for me, as I bang on about on this show all the time, suspension of disbelief makes you believe within the paradigm or the proscenium of the frame, and, and there's a hundred million decisions that can go wrong. They all have to go right for you to believe in them. And the thing is, a lot of people really just don't care, and I understand that. There's people that you know, I, I think looking for suspension of disbelief, especially in fantasy cinema, is 
it, it comes down to taste and discerning. You have to be discerning and things like that. I just happen to have been watching. I love genre fiction so much. I mean, you know, comic books too. Um, I love comic books that have more verisimilitude in them. Like, for instance, although there are comics, uh, when DC's renaissance was happening in the 80s, you know, I loved, for instance, I love New Teen Titans. I love the, the New Teen Titans seem to be set more in the real world than, say, Batman and the Outsiders, which was supposed to be goofy. It was supposed to have, it was supposed to be the fun Batman comic. You know, and you, you, you had so many different tones. That's another thing that helps with suspension of disbelief. But I think on all of our big franchises, we want to believe when Star Wars came out, even though it's an epic science fiction, actually it's a space fantasy, the thing was it made you believe. Star Wars and Empire 2, tonally, the story, the script, all of it, you know, when you land on Tatooine for the first time and you're at the Lars homestead, you see a sand crawler, you see those Jawas, you believe, man. You believe in R2 and 3PO. You believe in an astromech droid. No one had ever seen an astromech droid before. You see it in the first five minutes of Star Wars. You see R2 and 3PO. You believe them. You believe in them. I mean, who would have ever thought a spark plug robot is, is you know, effeminate <laughs> golden counterpart would be people that you would believe in or, pardon me, droids you'd believe in right away, but you do. You believe because all of the decisions that are made, the reason Star Wars works, and you know what? One day I'll teach a whole class on this. The first five minutes of Star Wars is something you should always look to because it makes you believe in the entire universe. Everything from the shot choices to the lighting to the costumes to the music to the design, five minutes and you're in. And what's interesting is the reason Star Wars doesn't work as much as, uh, 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 as nearly as well as it used to work, and it began to go off the rails with Return of the Jedi, the first five minutes of Return of the Jedi, I mean, after you leave Vader landing on the Death Star, although I would say there's a couple of map paintings in there of all those troops lined up that are a little dicey. But if you look at R2 and 3PO, rolling up to Jabba the Hutt's palace. It doesn't work. I mean, most people won't notice, but if you see it on a big screen, next time you watch Return of the Jedi, look at the lighting when they roll up to the door and the, you know, whatever the thing is. Look at that. You don't believe it. I mean, you might believe it, but if you look at it close and you really study what's going on, even the way the Gamorrean guards, all that stuff, it doesn't work. And, and you know, it's a simple thing to say. But the thing about Star Wars, the first five minutes of that movie, everything that happens on the blockade runner makes you believe. And that's why Star Wars worked. Star Wars had the entire world enraptured in five fucking minutes. Nowadays... Star Wars is hard pressed to convince you of anything. It just doesn't make you 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 don't believe. And that's the problem. You know, you can talk about why do these things not work? They don't work because the people that are making Star Wars do not know how to make you believe. They do not know how to make you suspend their your disbelief. They don't know how to actually make Star Wars to make you believe. Quantum Mania did not make you believe. Miss Marvel, the scene when, when What's-Her-Face is on at the beginning of the movie, lands on that planet looking for the thing. You don't believe that. That's not That looks like the same moon they landed on in Superman 2 in 1981. You're going, what? my God. I mean, you can point to things all over. Look at the difference between Alien and Alien Resurrection. There's a good choice. Go watch Alien. Now, you might look at those computer screens and go, eh, you know, 4 by 3 all that early computer graphics stuff they're using. But because of the way it's presented, you'll buy Alien. You will not buy Alien Resurrection. You won't buy it. Not as much. Everything about Alien Resurrection is 
you're watching a movie. Whereas the first Alien, I mean, you're watching a movie, sure, but you're watching something that could actually be happening. You never believe that Alien Resurrection's happening, ever. There's nothing in it, and that's, you know, Jean-Pierre Genet was, I, I love, like, Amelie, love Amelie, can't, Alien Resurrection, man, he it was not the right material for him. He doesn't know how to make you believe. Frank Darabont, when he made Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank Redemption, man. That movie makes you believe, and that's wildly entertaining. There's a lot of stylization in that film. It's a movie that's set in a prison, but you believe it. That's the hard thing. That's the key, creating that verisimilitude. Our franchises today don't know how because most of the people working on them now don't know how they don't know how you know their film david fincher knows how quentin tarantino knows how to make you believe within the context and he's mr stylization but he makes you believe he knows how to do it he knows how to do it his shot choices his actors he makes you believe the great directors scorsese you might not like all of his movies but he makes you believe in them and that's a tough 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 thing to do Anyway, um, that's my whole thing about movies and about entertainment. The best of those things, and whether it's a TV show like Shogun, makes you believe, man. It makes you believe. Comedies can make you believe. Romances can make you believe. War films, Apocalypse Now. You believe every fucking frame of that movie. That movie might as well be might have shot that on location. And it's it's... So many people do not know how to do that. Certainly studio executives. It's amazing to me that studio executives, they know not the first thing about how to create that verisimilitude. They know the first of suspending disbelief. They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. And yet they're the ones signing off on things. It's crazy. And that's the problem with Hollywood is that people are, there are too many people, too many filmmakers, too many things that are being made that do not make the audience make you believe they don't make you believe they don't know how and uh it's problematic problematic <clears throat> now there's one more thing before i i let me uh before i go into answering your questions or super chats if anyone's firing in because i i read this at the beginning of the top of the hour uh, the first time i did this show and um i uh i'd like to go back and and read this because um I think it's important and it means something to me. So we lost a, you know, I read a lot of books <laughs> and um, we lost a science fiction literary giant on the 20th. And there was an article um, in uh, Deadline about this today. And the reason that I wanted to cite this is because it harks back to the post geek singularity and the idea of the singularity uh, at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Werner Vinge, the Hugo Award winning, credited with insights into the singular. Pardon me, let me read that again. <clears throat> Werner Vinge dies. Hugo Award winner, credited with insights into the singularity in cyberspace, was 79. Werner Vinge is an incredible author, and he wrote a book that I recommend all of you read if you want to read gigantic epic sweeping space opera space sci-fi a fire upon the deep Werner Vinge whose expansive science fiction brought the concepts of the singularity in cyberspace to a wider audience died from Parkinson's disease at age 79 on March 20th in La Jolla California the confirmation came in a Facebook tribute from fellow author David Brin another favorite of mine a titan in the literary genre that explores a limitless range of potential destinies, Werner enthralled millions with tales of plausible tomorrows made all the more vivid by his polymath masteries of language, drama, characters, and implications of science, wrote Bryn. Vinci won the Hugo Awards for his novels A Fire Upon the Deep, A Deepness in the Sky, and Rainbow's End. He also won Hugos for novellas Fast Times at Fairmont High, and the Cookie Monster. Vinji's novella True Names from 1981 is frequently cited as the first presentation of an in-depth look at the concept of cyberspace. The author first presented the term singularity in 1983, borrowed from the concept of a singularity in space-time in physics. 
In a 1983 op-ed in Omni magazine, Vinji wrote, When this happens, human history will have reached a kind of singularity, an intellectual transition as impenetrable as the knotted space-time at the center of a black hole, and the world will pass far beyond our understanding. In 1993, he emphasized his points in an essay titled The Coming Technological Singularity, How to Survive in a Post-Human Era. The singularity concept claims AI will soon become super-intelligent, far surpassing humans in capability, and bringing the human-dominated era to a close. Bryn wrote, Accused by some of a grievous sin, that of optimism, Werner Vinge gave us peerless legends that often depicted human success at overcoming problems, Bryn wrote, those right in front of us while posing new ones, new dilemmas that may lie just ahead of our, uh, sorry, I uh, <laughs> just lost that, <clears throat> new dilemmas that may lie just ahead of our myopic gaze, he would often ask, what if we succeed? Do you think that will be the end of it? Vinji's concept influenced futurist Ray Kurzweil, who has written about the singularity several times at length in books such as The Singularity is Near in 2005, which is where I got the whole idea of the post-geek singularity. In a 2005 interview with the Center for Responsible Nanotechnology website, Kurzweil said, Werner Vinji has had some really key insights into the singularity very early on. There were others, such as John von Neumann, who talked about a singular event occurring because he had the idea of technological acceleration and singularity a half century ago, but it was simply a casual comment. And Werner Vinge worked out some of the key ideas. So here's to Werner Vinge. I hope all of you get a chance to check out some of his work. Again, I recommend A Fire Upon the Deep to start delving into his work. And, uh, you know, on March 31st, the Matrix celebrates its 25th anniversary. Uh, it was released 25th anniversary, 25 years ago on March 31st, which is crazy, but that's a week from now. So here's to you, Werner Vinge. I've been reading your stuff for decades. You shall be missed, but we'll always have your books to read. Anyway, uh, I read that at the top of the show when I did it the first time. So anyway... Um, let me get into what you guys are saying. First of all, uh, I'm sorry I've been talking a lot. I was trying to cover all this ground and do the same show twice, which is crazy. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, I just want to make sure where I'm at. Um, 1001 Johnny says, how important is the willing suspension of disbelief? No, don't suspend. Be willing to believe. Well, I would say, 1001 Johnny, the author or the filmmaker has to make you will willing to believe. Uh, to believe that's the key. That's 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 the thing that we need from our our creators. Um, Weston PDX says, "Oh no, out boomering Gary, and on your birthday, no less." <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, I've never done that before. I've never done a show. I'll, I'll t uh, this is not an excuse. But I've been using this new browser that I really love called Arc. It was recommended to me. I'm really enjoying it. ARC. It's a whole new browser. But I, I might have had something to do with that. I thought I hit start stream the way the way you start. The, I use this software called Wirecast, and um, it probably just just didn't click over. It was very weird. Darth Plato says, "Happy birthday, Rob. It's a good thing you're not in Ocampa." Or else you'd have only lived a week. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Blake Layton says, I love your show, Drunk from Basketball. What are your thoughts on Dennis not doing Dune Messiah if it's not as good as part two? Seems like a cop-out to me. Um, did he say that? I think he is going to do Dune Messiah. I think he has to. He's he's left. Dune 2 is, a, is, a, um, is kind of a cliffhanger. I mean... Dune Messiah, is, it's going to be a kind of a bummer of an ending, but I think he has to do it. Um, I think he has to do it. Absolutely. Uh, Petey says, the only because you have to finish the story of Paul Atreides. You know, you have to prove to the world that he's not some white 
savior, that it's the whole point of the story of Paul Atreides' story is to not follow false messiahs. Petey says, the only new Trek show I've seen is Picard. What other show should I see? Well, when you say that, the only new Trek show, have you seen the old Trek shows? Um, <coughs> I think that, um, to be honest, I mean, I, I think the one new Trek show that I actually turned out to be surprisingly good for me was Prodigy. I know it's an animated show, but it has more in terms of its spirit, more in terms of, of what I would think Star Trek can be. But again, it's an animated show, so and that's up to you. But uh, MK Solid 82 says, Rob will Gleaming the Cube. I saw Gleaming the Cube in the theater. Ever uh, come to Blu-ray? I thought it did. Did it not? Um, let, me, let me see. Maybe it, it didn't. Uh, I, I thought maybe I was thinking about Skate Town USA. Uh, I don't know why I can't get to Gleam the Cube. Well, we'll have to, I'll have to come back to you on that one. Um, maybe it didn't. Maybe that's why I can't find it. Um, Hunter Beck now says, uh, thank God for bringing this back to life. Yeah, Gleam the Cube, Blu-ray. It is on Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, it might be... I'm looking at the, I don't know if it's boot, a bootleg or not. I'm looking at the copy right now. Um, it's got a cool cover. And all he cared about was gleaming the cube until the night they killed his brother. Um, you know what? It's a Chinese import, so it's probably a bootleg. Now that I'm looking at it. Um, but it's out there. All region. So... Actually, there's one. Is this is this the DVD? Well, it's out there, but um, yeah, I guess it's just DVD. But there is a bootleg, so it's out there. It depends how much you want it. Um, Michael C. Marshall says Sony successfully relaunched four franchises in four years. Yeah, I mean, if you look at if you look at um, they they certainly did, and Ghostbusters is one of them. So there you go. <laughs> um. Joey Hamilton says, hey, Rob, did you pick up the term verisimilitude from Richard Donner? I've been watching Superman behind the scenes and he uses it a lot. Yeah, that's where I, but, but back in the day, back in like, I remember seeing some TV show, some documentary on the making of Superman Returns, Superman Returns, the making of Superman, the movie. And that's where I first heard the term. Yeah. And then there was, they used the same footage when they released, I want to say the DVD back in 2000 or something. Uh, Jeff Johns worked on that. That that those those special features. Um. Uh, Hunter Becknell. Hunter Becknell says, "Of all the souls I've encountered in my travels, Rob was the most birthday." <laughs> Peter Cunnington says, "Mythbusters did a bunch of Indiana Jones myths, and they're great." Timbula the Spider Monkey. Oh my God! As I live and breathe. How goes it, Robberino? Just popping by to say I'm still around, even though I'm not here for the live shows as much. I'll be lurking about in the background. Big love from down under. Timbula, the spider monkey, been here on this channel for a long time. Haven't seen you in a while. All right. All right. King's Advisors says, I'm sure you get this all the time, but I got to say I love your extras for Lord of the Rings. Uh, I'm on like my 30th rewatch of them. Well, King's Advisors, I want to say thank you very much. I always want to point out, though, that I was but part of a team. Uh, probably the best team ever assembled, I would dare say. I mean, look, I have lots of friends that worked on special features and have done great work. Charlie DeLazarica being at the top of that list. But I would say that the team that Michael Pellerin and Jeff Curdy put together to make the Lord of the Rings special features, we were possessed. And it was a great team of people. And I got to thank them. And Susie Lee, uh, for spending, I mean, I, uh, especially on Two Towers, I spent so much time in New Zealand, months actually, and um, it was a great, it was a great bunch of folks, great bunch of folks. Hemorrhoid Hertz says, I'm a longtime lurker. Today, I'm six beers in at 5 p.m. <laughs> I love that. What kind of beer? Are you drinking pints or beer bottles? Uh, I'd love to know. Steve Langford says, I hope you get your 4Ks of the Abyss, Aliens, and True Lies. I, will, I was able to get mine. I got lucky, I suppose. The Count of Monte Cristo and John Carter would be great in 4K. I agree. 
I'd love to see John Carter in 4K. Thanks, Rob. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, <laughs> Timmy the Spider Monkey says, here's some birthday quatloos for you. Who loves you, baby? Well, you do, Tim. I just want everyone to understand my birthday is May 15th. It's this ongoing joke. I just want everyone to know. Um, but it's still, it never isn't funny to me. Um, let's see. I just want to make sure that I don't miss any members, uh, members chats here. Um, I think I've got everyone's okay. I'm caught up. I'm caught up with everyone, which is good. And I got a few letters. I want to read a few letters and, um, We'll see what we say here. Uh, so here is a letter that um, this comes from Brian O'Singleton, uh, who says studios are committing suicide. Greetings and felicitations, Rob. It would seem to me that in the recent months, there has been a plethora of badly written, directed, produced, and all around ill-conceived films featuring popular IPs. Has Hollywood gotten lazy or just full of themselves when cranking out these films that are supposed to draw in the masses and bring in a hefty profit for the studio? With lackluster results in movies such as Indiana Jones and The Dollar Destiny, The Marbles, and Madam Web, when are the studios going to actually try and make a movie that is well thought out and well conceived and well regarded? It's as if they're not even trying anymore. Throwing out pieces of garbage and hoping the people will see it as a treasure. Just a random thought, musing on the current state of filmmaking, despite spikes, despite strikes, the film industry should continue to thrive and prosper. Sincerely, Brian O. Singleton. Well, Brian, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I think that here, here's, here's what I don't understand. If you're making a movie. Like, you want to make the Marvels, for instance. And you know kind of where you're going to go. you got Miss Marvel. You've got Monica Rambeau. You've got Captain Marvel. You know you want to make that movie. I don't understand why they don't find people that are passionate about that character to make that movie. The Here's, here's, here's one of the big problems that people don't understand about Hollywood. This is going to seem weird. The studios now are all making the same kind of movies theatrically. They're all making these IP-driven films that are 150 to 200 million dollars. The problem with that is that on the planet Earth, there's only about 10, 20 people in all of humanity right now that the studios would allow to direct their movies that would trust. And so they usually can't get those people, so they'll try and find the next best thing. They'll try and find somebody that's they think, like everyone says, they can control, which is so counterproductive. The last thing in you, the last thing you want, is somebody to direct your 150 or 200 million, 250 million dollar movie that isn't somebody who's making it their life's work. You want somebody who's as passionate about that movie, and that might be they think that could be the last time they're ever going to work. I mean, that's where we get greatness from. Francis Ford Coppola thought he was going to get fired when he made The Godfather every day. Steven Spielberg thought he was going to get fired every day when he was making Jaws. David Brown said, just keep shooting. You need people that make it their life's ambition. And the studios are hiring people that aren't. And I, you know, I, I don't understand where they're making these decisions to work on these big IPs. I don't get it. I don't understand. And then I don't understand why they make a movie like Miss Marvel. Or, uh, pardon me, The Marvels. I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't understand where in that process, from the time they hired the director, from the time they looked at the script, the people that made the Winter Soldier made Marvels. How does that even happen? I don't even understand. I can't even explain this to you. In what universe? You know, just just structurally, look at look at the Winter Soldier like I explained at the beginning of the show. With the on your left meeting Steve Rogers meeting Sam Wilson, if you just use that scene for every Marvel movie, not that exact scene, but go okay, we need what is our scene on the mall where Sam meets Steve? We got to do that. I mean, why why aren't they? I, it's so weird because Kevin Feige, the first twenty three uh, movies of the Infinity Saga, I, I I just I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't. It's weird to me. I don't presume to get it. 
it's like it's like uh you know in uh titanic i know you're melancholy i don't presume to know why <laughs> i don't know why that sticks out in my head um this comes from a lorenzo fletcher uh lorenzo fletcher says Hi, Rob. I don't know if you saw the movie Roadhouse has officially debuted the Centennial logo from Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Could you explain MGM's backstory and titles like you want to see released on 4K? I hope to hear from you and stay metal. I did. I watched Roadhouse and um, uh, the... Um, it is, it's a cool logo. I did see the logo. It is the MGM 100th anniversary. I was not impressed. I I gotta say, I watched Roadhouse, and I'm like, this movie cost a hundred. This cost eight, eighty five million dollars. They took the eighty five million dollars and they made Roadhouse. I'm like, eighty five million, and there's CG fights. So I I just I was perplexed. That movie should have cost you know they should have had Craig Baxley direct it, and I and I I love Doug Liman, but Craig Baxley should have directed it, and it cost fifteen million. I mean, I don't I don't. I, I I don't even know. And that movie was so it was everything about it was so weird and off. The shot choices, everything, the way characters acted, I didn't I didn't believe it. I did, could not suspend my disbelief. I did not believe in Roadhouse. I didn't believe in almost anything that happened in that movie, which was funny to me, and I certainly didn't believe that it would cost $85 million. But, you know, movies, MGM movies. A lot of the MGM movies that have not come out in 4K. Um, Logan's Run. Forbidden Planet. You know, those are those are two movies that I would love, dearly love to get. 2010. Not necessarily the greatest movie in the world, but I really like it as a space adventure story. Um, there's a lot of titles. And they're, they're usually the titles that Warner Brothers controls. I think North by Northwest. Where's that 4K? Love to get that, you know. Uh, I really would. But I like the logo. It's cool. It's classy. Although the CG lion is weird. I mean, I understand why they have to do a CG lion, but they can't. They can't film. They can't film one. Um, I don't know why, but they can't. Anyway, uh, now that I've done this show twice. Um, Jerem Maninen, all the way from Finland, says a fantasy book recommendation, God Killer by Hannah Kay. You are not the first person to tell me this. Uh, God Killer by Hannah Kay. Okay. Okay. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. I will, I will look into that. Uh, that sounds good. A God Killer is right up my alley. It's something I'm working on now, to be honest. Uh, but there we go. So I think, kids, I've said my piece about spending disbelief, verisimilitude, my favorite subject in the world, and I've done it now twice. Uh, I want to thank you for sticking with me on this chat. I want to thank you for supporting this channel via Super Chats and Tips and Memberships. We had a great membership call. We'll have another one in two weeks. Uh, the Matrix, celebrating the Matrix, we are having WonderCon next weekend. If you're going to be down in Anaheim, come see us. We're doing Starship Smackdown on Sunday. I think I'll be doing the, the Dune panel where we will be talking to uh, Max Avery, who wrote this book, A Masterpiece in Disarray. This is the verbal history of the making of David Lynch's Dune. I highly recommend it. It's a great book, and it's fascinating to read. So a lot of great stuff in there, a lot of great insights. So thank you for that. That'll be fun. Come come, come and see us. And on that note, I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a moderator and for calling me going, where are you? I can't. I, it's so odd to think that I did a show. I talked for an hour. See, you never know. Sometimes you're just talking to the screen light. I don't even know if you're out there now. You just never know. Um, But on that note, I guess uh, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> I know, hard to believe, right? Remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to all of you, have a better night. Now let's see if I can turn off this show somehow. 
<laughs> Let's see if that works. Because <laughs> one never knows.